Thanks for hosting us, Steven. It's nice to finally meet you. you know? yeah. Seeing you on a computer screen is not the same. Uh -huh. um, anyway, I know we're running a little late. I, you know, I would like to thank our sponsors, Dental Intelligence, Dental Intel as primary sponsor. If you haven't looked at what they're doing for practices, I would urge you to do that, Dental Intel. And then Utah Valley Dental Lab. Um, I'm director of education. They do all my work. They, they're a sponsor as well. So uh, without further ado, Dennis Wells. I think a, a lot of you know Dennis. I've seen him speak. He's probably one of the most sought after speakers in aesthetic dentistry and dentistry today. We've been friends with Dennis with 30 years, maybe. Yes. yes. Probably. We've done a lot together. He's a natural. He has a really unusual practice. Um, where he's doing primarily all very conservative aesthetic dentistry, and he'll he'll share that with you with a, an interesting demographics within his practice as well. And we've rode to Harley's together. We've gone to the beach. Again, if he lived in San Diego, he'd be you'd be my best friend. If I lived in Nashville, although it's too far absolutely. from the, we'd be absolutely the very best friends. So, uh, I want to thank you for taking time out of your life. You got uh, two boys, two teenage boys, and. And we're keeping you from them and from your wife, Doris. So without further ado, Dennis, take over, man. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> well, first of all, you might want to reconsider uh, any of you who are on, tuning in tonight that your speaker can't get, get the mountain and the central time zones uh, figured out. So you may, you may want to question my credibility right out of the gate. But uh, I thought I was 45 minutes early. So my apologies. It's totally my fault for the late start. Uh, but uh, it's an honor to be here, and uh, I hope it, we can have some fun tonight. And, uh, and David Hornbrook, you, everybody knows him uh, pretty much in the dental world and dental space and beyond. But I got to just tell you personally, he's one of those guys that I've always felt like I'm chasing. He's, he's a guy that's got this amazing um, hand-eye ability, and, and he's just passionate and energetic and all the things that that makes us want to be around him and learn from him. And I have truly learned so much. I, I have so much to give him thanks for, for our, my career and, and what little success I've had. So it's an honor to be here, David, and, and share with you some things that we've been doing. Um, we come from a very humble platform of, of just trying to, to get it the best we know how to get it in terms of the dentistry we're doing and how we treat our patients. And it's certainly a day by day learning experience that I, I joke with my patients all the time. You know, they call it dental practice for a really good reason, because you you never quit practicing. You never you never get there. And uh, that's certainly uh, my feeling as I on my 39th year of, of doing this stuff. And uh, so it's with humility that I share some things that and, and what I like to explain to, the, to my audiences when I speak to is that um you know, um, Judge Judy is one of my mentors because she has that famous book, Don't Pee on My Leg and Tell Me It's Raining. And I uh, really, I, I'm that kind of guy. You know, I, I really like authentic information and, and I like to only share things that I go, I know this will work. And, uh, and you know, there's probably a lot of other ways to do it, but this is one way that, that I've found in my own hands at least will, will work and get you the results you're looking for. So hopefully we can just talk about some things we're doing and, um, and, and again, have some fun. I've got a pretty long slide presentation, and, and I would hope that it's much more about just some casual conversations and interrupt any time. And, uh, and hopefully it won't be such a formal me talking all the time, but, but we'll interact as much as we can. If I can just Sound okay? Sounds good. If I can just interrupt first right away, right? Um, this is yeah. a live, so Dennis is here. If you have a certain question about something he's talking about or you're confused, you're excited, whatever it is, feel free to ask a question. Be sure to use the chat box. Don't use the other communication means. So like go the to Q &A the, the yeah. Q&A. Don't use Q&A. Use the chats. And if I don't get your question right away, then I'll wait till there's a good time. If it's a stupid question, I'm not going to ask it, so don't bother. But if it's a great question, I know Dennis is, again, he's humble. He wants to share as much information. He will ask that question. So um, I'll try not to interrupt you too much, Dennis. Please do, because, again, uh, I, I don't want to just sit here and give a presentation. I'd, I'd love to get a lot of good good dialogue going and a lot of good thinking here tonight. Um, so everybody can see my screen okay? This, this is coming through good? All good, Stephen, David? Great, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's 19 years this year 
that uh, practicing here in Nashville, and we get to see a lot of interesting people and um, and live vicariously through a lot of entertainers and things like that. Um, but it's 19 years this year that we started doing what we call no prep veneers and uh, no, no prep porcelain veneers. And it got to the point in my uh, little bit of lecturing I was doing that one day Mickey Bernstein called me up to ask me to, to speak for the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry yet again. Um, I was even beginning to get tired of myself speaking on the platform. And he goes, Dennis, we, we want you to talk, but please don't talk about prepless veneers. And so I didn't take it personally. And I created my lecture and basically renamed it to additive only veneers and still talked about the same thing because this is about all I know. Uh, I feel like this is one area that I've just, again, almost 20 years now have focused on trying to do restorations that look really nice, but are very conservative and don't have some of the negative issues that we all know can be in the mix, not necessarily, but can be in the mix when you're doing a lot of heavy preparation. And so um, that is where our journey began. And we continue to try to get better and better at this. And we are also trying to define some with humility some of the areas where it just simply isn't a good idea and where we've had some things that didn't age out like we wanted to, or, or, you know, we look at it and go the results of that could have been better if we'd have taken another direction, maybe a little more traditional type of preparations. And so uh, hopefully tonight we can kind of bring to the table a, a few of our more recent uh, conclusions and some of the things that we're now seeing and thinking so tonight, um, if you read the intro or, or the advertising about this, I was hoping we could talk a little bit about, first of all, just some cases that you can expect the additive only porcelain or the prepless veneers to really do well and be perhaps arguably the best way to do certain cases. And then we'll also look at something that's entered into my world in the last maybe 10 years of how airway and treatment planning from the airway out, as it's said, is really critical and how all of a sudden I started recognizing that we were in many cases just looking for anything we could to do prepless veneers on. And sometimes we're just overlooking that, that we're just camouflaging and sort of covering up a big, you know, bunch of health issues and, and instability that's going to plague us down the road. So we'll talk just a little bit about that. I, I personally suffer from sleep apnea. And so it's been a personal journey for me to understand that both as a patient as well as a, a dentist. And then there's a lot of uh, materials out on the market. Some of the best things that I've enjoyed using have gone away. Uh, I think David shares that sentiment too, as I heard him speak about uh, his thoughts about losing Empress. But um, we'll talk about particularly some of the lithium disilicate products out there and kind of the pros and cons of that. And then, um, I've been looking a lot lately at cases of ours that we've done that are 10 years or so. I've got two or three to show you. Uh, we're trying to track this a little more intently and get a little more real about our success rate and what's working good and what's not. And then uh, we have in, in recent years enjoyed doing a lot of uh, pretty much full mouth. Sometimes we're not quite doing all 28 teeth but we're doing a, a lot of upper dual arch, upper and lower arch uh, vertical dimension changes and doing it totally with prepless with doing absolutely no enamel reduction, which is kind of cool and exciting. And then lastly, I hope we can have some fun. Every time I'm around David, I could swear the last time I watched his, his program online here, he had already had at least a couple of shots of tequila. I'm not positive about that, but I think he, he had a little bit. He was did. pretty stretched back, you know, laid out and feeling pretty good, I think. I'm not going to let you defend yourself, David, but I think, I think that's uh, the case. So hopefully we can have a little fun tonight. Uh, I have to give credit to my ceramists and partners in crime. Uh, the Rigo boys have been a huge support to me in the last 10 or 12 years in this process, as well as Mark Willis. Um, and uh, we actually had the honor of doing prepless veneers on Juan's sweet daughter, uh, Natalie and uh, they, she, she made the, the big time advertising with Iva Clark with her Emax veneers, which we don't do a lot of those prepless these days, but uh, 
at any rate, the Rigo boys are, are unbelievable partners for me and have helped me so much. And then Mark Willis and I are, or where this idea actually kind of percolated almost 20 years ago. And he continues to be a, another partner in crime with this as well. And then, you know, for the first, I don't know, maybe five to 10 years, it seemed like we were on this journey to kind of prove to the world that, that you could do this without having to remove two structure. And there was a lot of, I don't know, errors in the back is too strong of an expression, but, but definitely a lot of people naysaying and going, there's no way that could happen. And so it was gratifying that, that somewhere in the 2010 to 2015, it seemed like the, the pendulum kind of shifted and a lot more people were, were saying, yeah, you can do this. And, and uh, Silas Darte uh, uh, published something in, in QDT 2016 that really kind of put some nice science and things that I wasn't able to do, uh, some institutional uh, research and so forth that was gratifying to see that okay, you know, lots of other people besides me are seeing that this is a possibility is something. It's, it's a tool that we believe everybody should have in their toolbox. We're certainly learning that it's not the only tool you need. And certainly we push the envelope of that and can look back now and see that sometimes we were a little overly enthusiastic about this approach. But this is a case that we did four or five years ago that um, I think still stands as kind of sort of the target that we try to hit where we have a beautiful um, biologic health and we have margins that are really difficult to see even with some magnification. We have polychromatic colors and layering and effects in the enamel, in the, in the porcelain that, that mimics enamel. And then we have um, proper balance between the teeth size and lips, all of which uh, comes together to produce a real compelling smile that in my judgment is, um, is going to rival anything we could do by taking away some enamel. And again, credit to Juan Rigo for some of the artistry that you're seeing here that we feel like is, is kind of the standard that we're searching for that, that we try to hit. And like with all of our cases, both prepless and conventional prepping, uh, some come out better than others. And, you know, when you're presenting and showing things, you like to show your best work. I hope to show a few things tonight that are not necessarily in that category, but, um, but certainly um, we're, pretty, we're pretty consistent, I feel like, in our laboratory approach and in our, our adhesion techniques and so forth, and in our treatment planning and, and strategic planning to where our results are pretty consistently what you're seeing here uh, day in and day out. And we love these kind of cases where we get to set up the arches orthodontically and kind of guide the orthodontist on the, on the layout that we need in order to come back with additive only approaches and get right where we want to get to. These cases are fun and we love to follow these young people uh, after it's all done um, and, and see how it serves them well. And this, this happens to be a young lady that's from uh, the Cayman Islands that uh, is actually a relative of, of my wife's and, and of course me. And so we get to track her and, and it's been fun watching her journey. And notice how we've had the pleasure here with the orthodontic treatment when she was younger to really get wide arch form uh, airway and all of the physiological features are, are in place here for her to breathe well and to not necessarily be prone to bruxism and grinding. So that plays into our hand as we're putting these felspathic restorations in place. We ask our patients to send us these candid shots after we've treated them because in the, in the final end game, we feel like this is where you prove you're winning or you're losing in their social interaction and how they look in candid shots and different lightings and things like that. So uh, we have a lot of those in our collection, which, which give us a lot of sense that we're, we're doing something right. And again, here's just another example that was more recent. We did this a couple of years ago. Uh, this was a young lady, a real pretty young lady hygienist that worked for me that had, you know, pretty nice looking teeth to begin with. Uh, she was not somebody that I was always longing to do something to her smile, but, but she was. She saw some of our results and felt like she, she could kind of go from really good to great. And, um, and yet we were able to do this without having to sacrifice her original smile. And so um, 
this is just an example, again, of what we can do and how we can add some umph and brightness if we want to, as we did here in this case, we wanted to really try to step it on up a little bit in terms of just the pizzazz. Um, and then here's another example that's a real world sort of thing where we, we've got a little bit of orthodontic issues that should have ideally been taken care of in this patient's younger years, but she kind of missed that window. And here she is in her senior year in high school. Her parents are good friends of ours. Our kids go to school together. <clears throat> and one day she said, is there any way you could possibly do something and me not have to wear braces again? So we went down to the office one evening and did this real fast little casual mock-up just to, to visualize and mostly to have her visualize what would be possible. And she got super excited, her and her parents. We were able to go on and do this um, in a way that we felt like was, was pretty cool. You know, it kept a little bit of her normal uh, alignment and things or her original alignment, but just kind of evened it out a little bit more, idealized it a little bit better. And then she not only sent me some photos, but she sent me this video of some her sitting there chatting and laughing and kind of normal head movements and things like that, which we were all pleased to see. Felt like it really represented her aesthetics in a good way. And then one more here, and we'll get into some meat of this stuff, but these are just trying to document to you guys that when you get a case where the alignment of the teeth, the arch widths, the, the anterior posterior relationship of the maxilla and mandible, when all of those things check off and basically we simply have a tooth arch discrepancy or you have just a little bit of wiggle room because you have a really full frame of lip that gives us a little bit of room to augment teeth just ever so slightly in some cases. Uh, in this case, obviously where we have diastomas, we know we have a, a definite tooth arch discrepancy. And many times as you, we've all seen in the clinical world, when orthodontists are charged with whatever you do, you know, just close these spaces up. Many times they're just, they're just, you know, swimming upstream trying to do that and gain stability because simply the arch is wider than the amount of tooth space to cover it. And so in many cases, it just makes more sense to acknowledge that in the front end and then increase the width and size of the teeth to, so that the arch and tooth size becomes more congruent. These, these are the kind of cases you want to look for in your practice. These are the kind of cases we try to seek out. And we've been doing this long enough that we get lots of referrals from other happy people, thank goodness, that are, you know, saying my teeth kind of look like her teeth or his teeth. And I think we, you know, would like to have the veneers that you guys do here. Once again, notice how when we're now treatment planning and diagnosing these cases, we're not just looking at the teeth or not just looking at, you know, uh, the defects within the teeth, but we're looking at, does this patient breathe well? Do they have great arch width and, and full development of the maxilla and the mandible? Do they have good anterior posterior alignment and relationships? And if they don't, then we're going to have a conversation where we, as, whereas we used to not have these conversations, but we will talk about from young people to adults, the things that are possible. And we'll explore a little bit about their sleep and you know, uh, ask some leading questions that we know will tip us off if maybe there's even some potential airway. Um, I'm not quite sure if, if this is the, the common thinking right now, but in some of the airway camps, it's beginning to be thrown around that there is a pretty much one-to-one -one correlation between bruxism and grinding and airway issues. Um, that's news to me that I, I did not have that awareness um, a few years back. And, um, and I find it really interesting and just anecdotally in my practice and just me personally, I do see that correlation to perhaps be true. If not one-to-one, -one, it's definitely strongly uh, related. So when we see a case like this, where there's nice development of the arches and simply just some smaller teeth, that's the kind of things that we get really excited about treating in our prepless fashion. 
Hey, Dan. And we're still you, using interruption there. Yeah, a question? Are, are you doing the expansion yourself? Someone asked, are you doing the ortho or are you working with uh, an orthodontist or, or someone that's doing that for you? Yes. It, back in the 90s, <clears throat> I took, I, I was what they called a, an MO, a motel orthodontist. I took a lot of orthodontic training and I used to, for five years, bracket up and do a lot, a good bit of ortho. And I did a lot of uh, uh, appliances, to mandibular advancement appliances and things. Uh, I had an influence there, a good buddy that was in my dental school class that really walked me along with some of that. And so I, I have a keen interest in it, but it didn't make financial sense and business sense for me. I learned to do that as opposed to the restorative things that I also love to do that I I'm more trained to do. So, um, so we don't do the ortho ourselves. Now we work with a, a couple of, of people who actually three different orthodontists here in our city that do different things. Um, and I, I encourage all of us to, to look at these things whenever we see orthodontic issues and at least have the conversations and we're, more and more we're, we're, we're getting better at doing that. And, and I think, you know, you brought it up earlier, the importance of working with the orthodontist <clears throat> in setting up spacing and don't wait until the orthodontist is done, right? And, and, you know, you have relationships like that. And I do as well, where the orthodontist literally would like to get the bands and brackets off, but it's like, no, you got to visit Dr. Wells, Dr. Holmberg first. They'll tell me if I can take them off. Because I found, like, like you said, orthodontists love to close midlines. And lots of times I get these cases, they close the midline where there's microdontia and I make them open it back up or I have them space the laterals different because they tend to move the laterals too close to the distal of the centrals. And it's like, dude, yeah, yes. with this restoratively, right? Absolutely. Those are excellent points, David. And, and it's, it's priceless to have a relationship with some orthodontists where not only um, are you able to directly guide what's happening and, and make sure that, that you're in the mix and the decision-making, but then they become a big referral source. Once they understand that you can augment teeth and not have to damage them and they can really, you know, push that to parents who otherwise would have a lot of pushback. If little Johnny or little Susie can only have this enlargement by drilling down their teeth Many times the parents are going, oh, wait a minute, you know, we've had issues because they were the early people on with the porcelain veneers before our industry perhaps figured out some of the things we can do better today. But um, bottom line is, is that your orthodontist will, will begin to really lean on you for not only guidance, but they'll send you patients oftentimes that they go, I'm going to struggle with this case. And can we just go on, on the front end and treatment plan this for restorations? So it's been a real win-win to, to have that relationship. We, we're big fans of digital scanning in our practice, and I'm not quite sure I understand exactly some of the details of this, but, uh, but the Rego boys still feel strongly that the rubber-based materials are still the best way for them to create the models they need and, and know where they are on the case uh, margin-wise um, as opposed to the digital models and the printed models. Uh, not sure if everybody would agree with that, but that's, that's where we are currently. Uh, hey, we use the digital. You yes. If, you mind if I weigh in on that a little bit? I wish you would. Yes. Okay. Oh, I would absolutely agree with you. I, I mean, I love the trio scanner and we're using it for opposing. We're scanning our provisionals or, you know, your yes. um, we're using it for all our study models. We do not do it for veneers, especially conservative veneers. Like the cases you've shown, there's no freaking way I would do digital on that. The problem, and this is a universal thought among most of the ceramists, the, the problem with this is not the accuracy of the scan. We can get a very accurate scan. The problem is once the, what they call the model builder, and that's the program that finds the margins. When it's looking for a margin, it is looking for a 360 degree circumferential margin. So what the computer, and this is all AI, it is going along the gingival margin. It gets into the interproximal elbow. And especially if there's a little bit of a gingival embrasure, and then you come up, let's say you didn't break through contacts, it does not know what to do. It goes into that embrasure and sends it straight lingual. And where we've seen it through Utah Valley is, we've seen problems with digital with veneers. 
um, is they just don't always fit. Not all the time. And it's kind of interesting because I was at the lab today and, and Josh, you know, Josh Walker, who does my yes. ceramics. I, I did a case yesterday at 10 over 10 and we took a polyvinyl on the upper and the lower. It's kind of interesting. It's, he actually had a, a, a benign cyst and the surgeon had placed a drain and I didn't know about it. He came in from out of town. So I've got this drain in there. There's no way I could take a polyvinyl. And so I, I took a digital where I would absolutely normally have taken a, a polyvinyl because very conservative in ears, didn't break through contacts. So I was talking to Josh today and I was apologizing to, I said, you're going to get this case the next couple of days that I scanned and I know that's a potential problem. So what he says they'll do is they'll still print the model, but they'll do a dupe. They'll take a polyvinyl impression of that model because they cannot trim the margins digitally, accurately, digitally when you didn't break through contacts. And Don, Don Bell, who's the digital guy at Ivaclar, I, I met with him last month, and he said he had gone around to multiple labs across the U.S., Gold Dust, Utah Valley, the Rego, and he didn't know about this. He says, yeah, that's what everyone's saying, just like the Regos said, no, we want a polyvinyl. And that's mm. the reason. It's, it's the model building program. Mm. I totally agree with you on that. Well, that that makes perfect sense. And, and I think Nelson and Juan have both tried to explain that to me in the past, but, um, but that I, I follow what you were saying there and that makes perfect sense. And so it sounds like for at least the uh, foreseeable future right now, we're going to stick to our polyvinyls and wait for the digital to get better and better. But, but we're, we're certainly on board with the digital stuff, like you said, in many other ways, and it's awesome. It really will spoil you in many ways, but uh um, going back to this type of dentistry where we're just taking a, a real good polyvinyl and um, in our normal materials, our blue moves to capture a bite. We're real big on John Coyce's uh, approach to occlusion and occlusion management and bite force management. So we like his little facial analyzer. Um, and then we're real big on doing what we call custom prototypes with composite. We just hand do these in the mouth. Um, this is not everybody's cup of tea. I realized that. And we taught courses for 10 years and we found that in our office that there's people that just kind of gravitate and kind of like to do this kind of thing. And then there's people that go, you know, shoot me. I'm not going to do this. That's, that's just not for me. And the great news is you don't have to do that in order to get some great results. I argue, however, that if you can develop those skill sets, it will really raise your batting average of how you're able to implement cases and understand exactly what your patient's looking for and give your lab greater, greater guidance. Uh, it, it will raise your game a little bit, but you can still certainly scoot around this by just having more traditional kinds of wax ups from your laboratory and matrices that are created. Um, but we spot etch and take our composite balls and then hand sculpt these prototypes. And we discover so many things when we do this. Um, you know, oftentimes people just love what we create the first time right out of the gate. In this particular case with this young lady, she hated our lateral incisors. I thought they were pretty okay, but she really wanted these flatter lateral incisors. And that's the kind of detail that we're able to kind of sift through um, when they wear these composite prototypes, which they're going to test drive for at least a week prior to us uh, ordering the lab case, sometimes longer if they're real fussy about things. Um, but we, we've enjoyed this process. Just, I have personally, uh, it takes me about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes to do eight or 10 maxillary prototypes like that, even less on the lower. Uh, so it's not that big of a burden to us. And then you can see here, the prototypes are in the middle screen. And then when, when she saw that she really wanted the, the flattened look. And so we ended up actually changing the prototypes. I don't have a picture of that. But you can see how she was pretty intentional that she wanted the laterals a different shape than what we made them. And uh, I like both and, and, and happy to do either one. But in, in this case, it was important that we did that, that style of, of uh, smile design so that she could weigh in and all that. And so these kind of cases where you've got smaller teeth, uh, you're wanting to increase, you, you know, you're not desiring to leave your teeth in the same exact size that they were originally you're desiring to enhance the size of them so those are the perfect kind of scenarios uh to do prepless porcelain veneers 
and come out what, with what we believe to be real good results. When we show this case, a lot of times people are curious to know how do you manage path of insertion and how do you not have uh, issues with you know marginal integrity? And the simple answer to that, and it is very simple, is that we do have marginal issues. Uh, no matter what technique you would use, whether it would be refractory dye or platinum foil, uh, you're gonna have some path of insertion issues here. But what is wonderful is when you're doing additive only, you don't really have anything to cover up. You don't have exposed dentin. You don't have some defect in the tooth necessarily to, to hide. And so our, our instructions to our ceramists is build this facially to the contours and to the look that we're going for. And then when you seat the restoration, it's backfill with your resin cement. And um, you, can, you can use some of the heavier field resin cements, even some of the restorative composites for your cement and heat those if you choose. We've had good luck using uh, some of Ivoclar's resin cements. And um, we've not found issues with that because the backfill is relatively still very small and slight in terms of the whole size of the tooth and the restoration. But um, that technique we've been using for years, uh, one of my buddies, Pascal Magne, is big on the backfill of restorations like that because he's also big on conserving enamel. And so I don't think I stand alone with that, with that uh, belief and, and that, you know, that success that we've enjoyed with that, that technique. So you can easily manage diastemas even when you don't have path of insertion. Just some little show and tell here. I like these one-to-one -one views of our prepless stuff. I really, I really like to tout that the infinity margin, as we call it, where we're, we're feathering this in the mouth uh, with the felspathic porcelains, is pretty hard to beat. I, I was an examiner for the AACD for about 17 years, and I got to see a lot of great dentistry, a lot of great ceramics, a lot of great hands and eyes. And I never saw anything that I felt like was any better um, than these infinity margins with felspathic veneers. Um, I will tell you that using the lithium disilicate, I'll kind of fast forward a little bit here for you uh, on that subject of material selection, I struggle with that to get the kind of margins and the kind of optics that you see here with the felspathic powders. Um, it, the, the, the lithium disilicate is so hard and so strong and so wonderful in many ways, but the hardness factor is almost too much when you're trying to finish margins in the mouth. They become almost brittle. So once again, we end up with real nice results. If you look at the lingual of these, I wish I had better views for you could see how the porcelain extends out facially. It's back filled with the composite. It's all feathered and smooth and um, very, and, and very long term in terms of, of the way that will function and wear. So as you are looking for those home run cases, you're looking for those ones that you really just know the additive only is going to serve you well. We came up with this little acronym FIT, which stands basically for frame, for the incisal presence, and for the actual size of the teeth. We call it, it's real simple, FIT. So when we look at the frame, we're talking about the lip size. And just like in a picture, the frame and the picture need to have some sort of a relationship that is pleasing to the eye and, and is symmetrical and is uh, balanced. And so many times what we find is that people uh, like this gentleman have enough lip size that there's a lot more wiggle room to enhance the size of the teeth a little bit. And we've even gotten to the place where we're pretty big advocates of doing lip enhancement on people that aren't blessed with big, big lips. And obviously you can, you can go too far on that and, and create things that are not very pleasing to most people. Uh, some ladies really seem to kind of go crazy with too much of it. But if you enhance the lips just a little bit even, it really is amazing how much more forgiveness that gives you in most situ situations to enlarge the teeth just a bit. So this gentleman has got, you know, 
pretty, if you measure these teeth, they're, they're not going to be necessarily that small, uh, it probably an average seven and a half, eight millimeters wide or something like that. But he's just got real big arch and he's got real big lips. So that's a perfect situation for us to, to apply the prepless principles. And then the incisal edge, when you look <clears throat> particularly from just the lateral view, and you look at the distance from the facial surface of the central incisors to a, a line drawn from the upper to lower lip, <clears throat> excuse me. If you see this kind of distance between those teeth, then and, and then the other thing we're looking for is the incisal edge inside the wet dry line on the lower lip. And if you've got this kind of relationship and you're inside the wet line dry, the, the wet dry line rather, then you're golden. You, you've got room, we, we believe, to, to augment some facially and it'd be very pleasing and look very normal. And then lastly, you look at the actual size of the teeth. And some people just have small teeth. We put our caliper on them. They're just substandard in terms of their width and length. And so all of these factors, we're constantly just intuitively looking at these days to look for those cases. And when we find one such as this, it's real easy when we go in and do our composite prototypes as we did, as we're showing you here, uh, to, to kind of know what to expect. We, we know we got a really good fighting chance that, that we can make this look right and make it look appropriate and balanced and not have to take away precious tooth structure. So when you go back into your practices and you start looking for cases, you know, we're with, with again, almost 20 years of doing this, we're intuitively looking for cases just like I've showed you, where we have good airway, we have good arch development, we have good basic occlusal alignment, and we have some room one way or another, either through large lips or through small teeth or some version of all of that, uh, some room to augment and to, um, and to do that very successfully. So looking back here historically just a little bit, um, and, and starting to track our cases and to see how they perform. This is the very first case as we go back and look that we ever did prepless. And the interesting part was, it maybe is a little stretch to say it's prepless because she had had, had this bad habit of sucking on lemons. So she had actually had a, a good bit of enamel erosion of eight and nine. Uh, we felt like at that time that her cuspids were great. So we, never, we didn't put veneers on those. We just did the front four and then we did the bicuspids. Um, and notice as she ages on down, so this is a six year post-op. And at that point in time, we're still thinking things are pretty good. She's still pretty happy, uh, still reads pretty good. We're not really seeing anything that, that draws our eye to it too much, but we're seeing a little bit of the marginal zones beginning to darken a little bit, either through a little bit of gum recession or through some staining, so forth and so on. But then notice a 10 year recall and she's really changed a lot, hasn't she? 10 years can really change a person. Um, but then we started noticing as we got up a little closer, okay, a little more recession. And one of the things that we really started recognizing that we had to change in our thinking was that we were telling people we're doing absolutely no harm to the teeth to put veneers on them and that they could be even considered reversible. We still believe a large part of that is, is pretty true, but here's what we didn't, we didn't really intuitively see, is that when you lengthen teeth, as we all know, you're increasing the leverage force that now can be put on those teeth in protrusive and excursions. And what we have seen is that we have actually accelerated in our judgment recession on some teeth that we did not have the foresight to keep them protected and night guards and, and, you know, protective nocturnal devices. And suddenly we see an acceleration in recession. Obviously this is not just unique to prepless teeth, but when you create a, what, you know, the, these feather margins, and then you watch it age a little bit, we still feel like that it is superior optically to doing a prep margin where you have a more visible start and stop situation. I have done some prep cases where we hit the magic spot where the chamfer that we created and the thickness of the porcelain, all of that came together in such a way that the margin was still pretty undetectable. But for most of my cases, it seems like the margin is more definitively notable 
whenever we put a margin. And I think some of that is just because your, your ceramic is just going to be thicker there. And unless you transition in your powders and, and, and you use powders, period, you know, if you're using more pressed stuff, it's going to pretty much be that same uh, color that's going to have a little more chroma involved because it's thicker. And so um, of the two choices, I still believe this may be superior, but we are noting that there's this little tendency as we get toward the 10 years or, or beyond to get a little darker around the margins. And some of that, again, may be where the tooth itself is getting a little darker. Some of that may be where uh, we've got recession. And sometimes if they have poor hygiene, we're seeing actually, you know, some breakdown and some staining around the, the gingival margins. One of the things that's really interesting that my uh, partner right now, Dr. John Monroe, who, who was the guy who discovered the whole bleaching back in the 80s and has the famous Monroe patent for the carbon peroxide systems. But one of the things that we started thinking about is if we not prepped off any of the enamel of this tooth, do we have any chance of bleaching even over the veneers and getting lingual penetration and getting penetration around the gingival areas where maybe there's a little bit of tooth still exposed that's in enamel and so forth? And the answer is we absolutely have. We've actually seen some color brighten in the, in, in the entire body of teeth. And then we've seen the necks of the teeth improve by just you know, smoothing and, and really uh, refinishing the marginal zones some and then doing some post veneer bleaching. Definitely a paradigm shift for me, but we're doing more and more of this as we're looking at some of these cages, cases that are 10, 15 years out. And uh, I don't have those on, on cue tonight to show you yet. We're trying to accumulate enough body of those to feel like we've really got a, a absolutely truthful um, technique. But Dr. Monroe and I remain pretty excited that this is going to be a feasible thing to do for many of our cases. Here's another case we did back in 2004, one of the earlier ones. And here it is right after we, sit, we sat it. And then here we are in 2009. And once again, notice how we're starting to get a little bit more of a notable darkening or warmth at the gingival one third of, of the restorations. I, I think that would likely have to be just because the teeth themselves are getting a little bit darker as, as they're aging. And then we're seeing a little bit of recession and a little bit of this darkening around the gingival zones, much like the other cases showed you. So today, this would be a good case for us to consider going back and whitening with just regular whitening trays and see if we can't rebound a little bit of some of that color as well as polish and smooth and be sure there's no surface stains or, you know, just, just things that will buff off of there around the tissue. And then here we are in 2013, um, still hanging in there real nice. Um, both of these cases I'm showing you had no problem with chips. We have had a significant number of people that as they get into the 10, 15 year range, we're seeing little chips. Maybe a lot of times it's on the, it's on the canines, which we kind of halfway expect with a, a cuspid guidance and so forth issues. Uh, every now and then we'll see a chip on a bicuspid you know, just a little small chip here or there. Um, we have seen a fair amount of them on laterals, but, but that all of us know that laterals are the number one veneer corner to chip, right? When we do these restorative cases. So we're pretty, we're pretty uh, intent on clearing that in our excursions and things before we release them. But one of the things that we have, uh, that we have noted with the chips is that the felspathic powders if they get you know, put under a lot of load for several years, we're probably gonna see some tendency for those to fail uh, a little bit. And again, the chips are not so catastrophic. They're, they're things many times we can just smooth a little bit and keep right on rolling, um, but it is annoying. And the powders are roughly about the same megapascals of compressive strength as their original enamel, according to the science that we're looking at. Some of the Nortaki powders that we're using right now seem to be in that range. So we're, we're telling our patients, 
as we are doing these cases, the expectations is that if you wear your teeth normally and do normal things, there's a pretty good percentage of chance that you're going to see some wear and tear, just like you would see on your original enamel. And if you don't want to see that, and if you really want to buy some little insurance policies is the way we describe it, um, then we're going to suggest that you do two things. One, you really become more, you become pretty hyper aware of your lower and upper teeth colliding together and have a lot more sense about not doing that as hard and vigorous as maybe you did prior. And then of course, the other is the nocturnal protection with, uh, with, with a night guard. Um, we have, we have included that in our pricing for the last four or five years. As a matter of fact, it's not optional. They get a night guard, whether they want one or not. We're real big on the Jimmy Eubank E appliance, which is a dual upper and lower arch coverage, um, that we have had great success with. And so that's part of our strategy now to try to minimize the chips and the breaks, but we do have a, a realistic understanding that for people to go 20 years or beyond and not have chips is possible, but they're going to have to definitely deviate in most cases from some of their original behavior and definitely going to have to protect it a little bit more intently with, um, nocturnal protection. Hey, Dennis, can I, can I butt in here? Yes, sir, please. And, you know, you've kind of mentioned like, this obviously is not an occlusion course and you can't give, you know, them weekends of uh, information as you talk about this, but I know you certainly pay attention to this. You know, if you have, if you have anterior wear already, there's a good chance there might be a posterior interference. And we're not going to talk about the programmers, but we need to understand that because if they have chips now or they have short teeth, they're going to posture forward, even in what we call functional wear, and they're going to chip the veneers. The other thing, and you mentioned it too, is, again, just going in, and even though it's enamel only and it's glass and we think it's strong and it's conservative, doesn't mean they can't break these things off. It's just like enamel, right? And if we, don't, right. If we don't truly understand the elbow <clears throat> function as they're chewing, especially if we lengthen and, you know, I've had some failures certainly in my past and I, I'm sure you have not many, but a couple yeah. just as a function, you really got to look. And this is why the prototypes are so important because I know so many dentists that say, Oh, you know, I didn't prep. So I, I I'm not going to provisionalize. <laughs> and I mean, that's where I'm sure I, I mean, I've seen it a lot where you've seen some failures with the prototypes where they're chipping or breaking the prototypes. And if you would have gone right to porcelain, you know, your definitive restorations would have failed. You did. Yeah. And so really paying, again, this is not an occlusion course. I'm, we're not going to be able to answer it in, in chats, but really look, especially with the prototypes or whatever provisionals you use is have them do a chewing motion and they should come in contact in a single point. If they're hitting and sliding back and you can see, you know, I call them skid marks up that incisal ledge. ledge you're going to have a failure. And, 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 you know, I know you pay attention to that, but I think it's so important, especially with these young dentists that maybe didn't get the education in dental school, the practical occlusion to really look at how are they managing occlusal forces and, and, and where in the anterior. You know, I couldn't agree with you more about that. And uh, I am actually going to, if time permits here, I am going to show you a little bit of how we are managing, you know, the tougher situations and, and, and the obvious super compromised situations uh, with our, our minimum preparation stuff. But uh, the point I'm, I, I really hope I, I'm making here tonight is that as we're looking at, you know, these nine, 10, 15 year cases, um, we're, start, we're trying to get very real about how they're holding up, how they compare to traditional veneering and so forth. And then most of all, you know, what can we possibly do to extend the longevity of these cases we're making that declaration now to our patients as we start our relationship with them is that we're not just interested any longer in doing stuff that just looks good for a little while. We're, we're our, our view is of success is we need to try to make this long-term. So to your point, if you're not really dialed into occlusal forces and all that comes along with that airway um, and, and, and all the other habits and, and lifestyles and things that can involve and create failure, uh, then you're, you're just going to be frustrated a lot. And I, and I lived that in, especially in some of my earlier years of practicing. And so 
uh, again, we're practicing and <laughs> we're getting better. Um, but this is an example of a case that has been in the mouth, you know, nine years that, that we feel like is by and large serving this patient very well. So very, very happy people here. Um, now I want to take this abrupt pivot here and, uh, and say, you know, I've showed you some cases that were, that what we believe you should be looking for, that we feel like can really help people and preserve their enamel and preserve a lot of uh, yucky stuff that people don't like to go through and make you a popular dentist in, in the cosmetic world. Um, however, we unfortunately don't just get those kind of people that need help. We get people like this. And um, interestingly, you know, we're, we're in the middle of treatment planning this person, but our, our approach is so dramatically different with this guy today than it was even as recent as 10 years ago uh, about first talking with him about sleep and airway. And as you might guess and imagine, I'm sure many in the, that are with us tonight, you know, you, you've, delved, you've delved into the whole sleep apnea world and the whole obstructive sleep apnea. Well, this guy has serious problems. He's failed sleep tests numerous times. He's failed to be able to, to make a CPAP work. And so we had to have a long conversation about how he is setting us up for anything that we adhere to his teeth or, or do to try to significantly alter his appearance and his look and his bite. You know, we, we got a lot of things here to be really, really concerned about. And, and the prognosis is definitely going to be impacted dramatically. And so, uh, interestingly, after talking about all of this, he declines. He says, uh, I'm not going to do the, because we, we suggested he go visit with somebody about maxillary and mandibular du double jaw surgical expansion and advancement to try to alleviate a lot of these issues as well as correct a lot of things that are going on here, which would make the perfect platform for us then to come back and then do some tooth augmentation at the end of that journey. As you might guess, that's a, tar that's a hard sell for many people and, you know, a tough one. And, and so we're, we're happy to also look down the road at what are some other things that we could do with less and less enthusiasm, but still perhaps be very successful in at least in the patient's judgment. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, that's something that I really want to emphasize that we are now um, looking at how camouflaging a case like this is so radically different than camouflaging one that I've showed you earlier, where we had all of the foundation in place and we are set up for long-term success with those kinds of cases. Uh, this case, we do believe strongly, um, would probably not be a good case to go in and do a lot of enamel reduction. Everything is inclined lingually. Everything is relatively uh, lower in visibility and presence. I mean, he does have some recession and a little bit of length on those teeth that's not that great. But, but in general, um, if, if you were to prep these teeth a whole lot, you're simply going to need to come way more facial uh, to, to ever get into an aesthetic zone. So we would argue, is it really smart to do that versus just do augmentation only? So we would argue that you could take this case and open the vertical with posterior restorations, with posterior lithium disilicate, and then um, move forward like that. So I'll show you a couple of situations. And this, this again, is this, the, the occlusal views are the same person. And there's all kinds of red flags here, uh, but mostly the fact that he has no tongue space. And that tells us he's going to brux and grind in his sleep. And so that's going to always be a threat to him. So I'll come back in a second and, and talk about how, first of all, we have these products we have to choose from. And when the lithium disilicates first came out, when Emax hit the, you know, hit the showroom floor and it was so great and strong and tough and all that, it looked like this is going to be the answer to so many things. And it really is. And, and some of the new products, we, we happen to be big fans of Amber Press right now, one of the new variations of lithium disilicate. Um, but there's definitely a place and there's definitely a lot of great things about it. But it turns out it did have some things that were not so great. The, the marginal integrity of it and the fit and all of that can be really strong compared to some of our, you know, clumsy or felspathic techniques. But what we have found, again, I've already alluded to, is that trying to finish these margins post cementation in the mouth is pretty much impossible. And, and you'll dole out your diamond burrs uh, 
and you'll create a lot of heat. And guess what? When you create heat, that breaks down your resin cements. So all of a sudden your resin cements are no longer what they would normally be as you watch this case age. And that's one of the things that we have over the last 10 years been able to document and observe is that we are absolutely creating enough frictional heat, even using water with this hard, with these hard products that we're creating uh, some resin cement breakdown. So when we look at the advantages of, of the felspathic, uh, you can get them in different strengths and different grain sizes. Uh, it's really frustrating that Ceramco 2, I still think, and, and it's just personal bias, I think it was one of the like almost perfect dental materials in terms of optics and everything. And it was the bigger grain. It was relatively strong. And, uh, and so doggone it, they quit making it. And we don't have anything near that right now that I'm aware of. But you can certainly do a lot of things, and, and it's very user-friendly when you work with the felspathic powders. And the disadvantages are obvious. You know, it's not as strong. I wish we had all those properties of, of Emacs, but it was very user-friendly because I would love to be able to avoid some of the little wear on the cuspids and little chips and things that we've seen as it ages out several years. And I, I think if we had the strength of the Emacs, that would be the case. But um, the Emacs in addition to having the, the hardness factor about it, it is a monochromatic material. And so working around that, you know, we, our laboratories have fought valiantly to try to come up with a way to make them look polychromatic. And, and the Mia stains are, are popular right now, and they certainly can do a decent job of, of making things look pretty polychromatic sometimes, but your hands off with that. And in the prepless world, being able to do last minute little contours and, and reductions and, and things. Sometimes once you bond it in uh, is, is critical. And so the, the Emacs, if you touch the color of it and your surface stains, you're in trouble. If you cut it back and then add some felspathic porcelain, now you're back to the weaker porcelain. That, you know, I, I've done a lot of cases like that. And, and I used to think that was really just so smart. But then it began to feel so stupid because of all the places you need the strength of lithium disilicate, it's right at the inside of the ledge, right? And so we quit doing that. Um, we have tried to cut out windows on just the facial only and layer over that. That's currently how we manage it so we can get more polychromacity in it. And occasionally we will stain one if we're, uh, if we're pretty confident in our, that the ceramics contours and all that are going to be spot on. But there's, there's definitely some clumsiness using the press lithium disilicates in the, in the way we're trying to, to do dentistry. Um, and, and, and the ingots, sometimes you want, it seems like they got all these ingots, but they don't have just the right one that you're looking for that has just the perfect amount of opacity or, you know, the perfect amount of, of filtering. So the frustrations linger on with us in the lithium disilicate world, but we have been able to do some cases here or there and in fact, when, when we did Juan's daughter, who I'm showing you now, uh, back in a, a prepless course, um, we actually did an A-B comparison and, we, and he, did, he did, built two cases. He built one out of felspathics and one out of the Emacs. And he ended up, we ended up seating in the course. Everybody was in agreement that they really liked the way the Emacs looked. So that's what you're seeing here is her final work in Emacs. And once again, I like the way this reads in the casual photos and in the casual lightings and things like that. So I, I really feel like it's a, it's a possibility um, when we do use the Emacs, instead of me finishing it down in the mouth anymore, we're simply having the ceramics post-pressing to rubber wheel the facial margin to where it is literally sharp enough to cut you, like where it's just knife edge sharp. And we're seeding those and cleaning the cement off and calling it a day and leaving a little bit by design, just a tiny bit of a, of an emergence, you know, we'll call it a little bump. Um, usually it's pretty friendly and we don't see a lot of issues with that. Uh, but we were seeing issues whenever we were trying to smooth a lot with the lithium disilicate in the mouth. We saw all kinds of issues there. David, would you agree with those comments? Is there any questions about any of that? Yeah, yeah, you can. Going through a lot of stuff there. 
we've over and I don't use Emacs hardly anymore. I'm using Leasty Press. I mean, that's the way. Yes, we've that's another great one. And like you said earlier, if I had to redo my teeth today, they would absolutely be Empress, but it's not available anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm at 23 years with my Empress, and I do everything that I tell my patients not to do, from biting <laughs> yeah. to opening my burritos. Yes. Um, so we're using Lisi Press. The only thing that I would say is one advantage of of using a pressed or even a mill, which say people wanted a milli max, these thin, most of the time the enamel is, is not really polychromatic and the gingival third, they can, you know, the enamel is, is pretty much one shade. <clears throat> so your, most of your color is coming from the underlying enamel, right? So having it monochromatic per se, although we'd want to translucent, you're getting a lot of color from underneath. You know, I've seen, I saw your, your brother's case when I was there, what, 20 years ago, you know, in Nashville. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would agree with you on that. I, I totally agree with you that the most aesthetic restorations you will ever see and the most invisible margins you will ever see are powdered liquid ceramics. Um, whether it be felt spathic or, or whether it be floor appetite. I totally agree with you on that. And, you know, the problem, and we have a lot of young dentists listening now, is we're kind of taking it for granted that people know how these things are made. Are you going to talk about refractory versus foil or how they're made at all? Briefly, briefly, no. yes. They're not teaching that in dental school. And a lot of people are saying, I don't know what you're talking about. The one advantage of the powder liquid, you know, you, you know, this is you can literally make the margin completely clear. And when I used to do a lot of powder liquid, literally I would have all the color put in and be very polychromatic. And I would tell them to make the one millimeter of margin, gingival margin, completely clear. And you would look at it and you would see this clear line and then you put it in the mouth and it just disappears. And, and I think that's what you've seen in your, in your cases in the, where the patient does have ginger recession, you can't see the veneer margin. It just looks like a natural tooth with gingival recession, right? Because it's so invisible. And, you know, we've seen, and you know, I've got a lot of cases I've done that are, you know, at 20 to 25 years old that, they're pressed ceramic and they get gingival recession and you can see that margin for the same reason you just, you just mentioned. So mm -hmm. I totally agree with what you're saying. Well, and, and I am not poo-pooing at all on the lithium disilicate. And in fact, I use a fair amount of that in my practice and I'm about to show a couple of cases where we're definitely using it because the, the strength of that is unbelievable. And, and I am a big fan of the Amber press milky white kind of color ranges that are notably different optically from the Emacs ranges of colors that, that I was familiar with. And so um, there is definitely, and I certainly agree that, that sometimes you can get that perfect combination of some warmth from the underlying tooth structure, and it does not give you a sense of, of monochromatic. It, you know, there, there's a lot, and a lot of times, honestly, our patients are seeking something that's very monochromatic, not completely, but they're seeking something that's far more monochromatic than we dentists typically lean towards. So um, there's a lot of space in my practice for using the lithium disilicates a lot. I'm just hope I'm making the point clear that in trying to do uber conservative dentistry with it, it it's, it's a struggle, at least for me, most of the time to get it to work out just right though, as I showed you with Juan's daughter, it can happen. It, it's just, the underlying structure has got to be right. The right end good. Everything's got to kind of line up right. And it's a little, it, to me, it's a little dicey doing it like that, but um, it, it's, we don't have the perfect product. That's, that's, that's the clear truth, isn't it? We, we just simply don't. Um, well, moving forward here, uh, I'll show you some more radical kinds of situations where, uh, again, we feel like there's a place to take, real conservative dentistry and apply it in, in pretty extreme places. Uh, this, this guy's a, a neat example. He's a good friend of mine. In fact, we just got back from being together in Mexico and um, he, he was a uh, West Point grad, uh, a, a special ops guy, a, a badass dude, if there ever was one. And his teeth reflect that. Um, he's got a class three profile and an end to end kind of occlusion and just a wreck. And so, you know, right out of the gate, I know stepping into this and intersecting with this, that if we don't have a lot of understanding, me and the patient, we're in for a ride. And because this guy could chew right through metal or anything, there's no question about it. 
but he was very eager and very coachable and very interested to change his look. He had hit a stage in life where he just like was self-conscious about it. And so the interesting part here is by opening his vertical dimension, we reduced his class three to more of a, of a dental class one, giving us the room to do the lower veneers without preparation. And then also giving us room to build back his upper teeth. And, and once we created that connection, then we explained to him, and if you will commit to wearing nocturnal protection every night, and if you will commit, and, and you're probably going to do this a little bit anyway, but if you'll commit to just not using your teeth like you used to, um, then we've got a fighting chance that we can use our normal materials and, and you'll come out just fine. And we're now three years out on this case. I wish we had a lot longer than that, but we're three years out and he's not torn, chipped, broke anything. So, and, and the interesting part is that we elected after talking about the pros and cons to use felspathic uh, powders on his anterior upper and lower six teeth. And then we used all Emacs on the occlusal coverage on the lower teeth. I'll show you exactly how we did that. We had him go into a deprogrammer a little bit. Sometimes we have found that um, with class three people, you don't have to deprogram very long at all because they're pretty much on a hinge axis that, and they're pretty much vertical chewers. And so we felt like we were, we, we kind of knew where we were here with this guy, but we had, um, we captured his mandibular position in the vertical place we wanted. We sent that to the lab. They waxed up um, a guide for us and made matrices. We created these Lux attempt temporaries at that new vertical. And we captured bites with that in those segments. And then we hand built additive only uh, the porcelain powders on, and, and, or rather the composite prototypes on the top. And then we use the Lux attempt temporaries on the lower. And then we went to porcelain after he test drove those for several weeks. And as I said, he is uh, three years out with this case. And I'm crossing my my toes and my hands every time I'm around him because we knew going into it. And I explained to him that we could use lithium disilicate on his anterior teeth up there. They just might look a little bit less exciting or, or believable. He was all about trying to, at least in my hands, I'm going to put it that way. And he was all about trying to get a look that he felt real comfortable with. He said, I'm willing to try that. He, he does real well financially. He said, if, if it doesn't work, we'll cut them off and we'll put the, the harder stuff on. So interesting case, but one that we feel like that we knew going into this, that we had to do a good job of coaching him on how he has to not use his teeth like tools. And now he has to, you know, be cognizant of his bike forces a little more when he's conscious. And then he's got to be religious about the night guard. So we did the upper eight. Uh, with, again, the posterior teeth being in the lithium disilicate, but the anterior upper and lower six in uh, felspathic. And then here's another case, again, getting into more of this kind of range of wear and tear and compromise. This guy, uh, same sort of story. He was sick of his look. He wanted to, he wanted to euthanize his smile, as we say. And um, he had bicuspid extraction ortho when he was a teenager. He had some recession. Uh, we like to point out this, this work done by Pascal about loss of enamel volume and how our goal is to try to not take away more enamel volume. If you think about it a little bit, when people come in like this, and particularly Bo, who've lost, you know, pick a number of it, say 20% of their enamel volume or 15 or 18. And then our, our therapy to correct that is to take off another 15 or 20% of enamel volume, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm being very idealistic here, but, but, and I, I just finished a case the other day where we felt like it was appropriate for us to take off a lot more enamel volume to try to get a path of insertion, to try to get this Uber kind of perfect thing that this patient was desiring. But, but again, if there's another way we can do it and get to the finish line, I think it, it it's worth considering and weighing the pros and cons of these things. And we continue to try to discover when did we make a good decision on that? And when did we make a bad one? Because we all know there's a reliability factor that we've been doing for decades 
when we do more conventional preparations and we do allow for, you know, three quarters to a millimeter of thickness of the ceramic, a lot of factors that make that very predictable to us. Um, but we're trying to say, are there some other ways for certain people that maybe would even be more, you know, possibly pleasing to them? So this guy, we felt like had a lot of issues that we really need to talk about. Same sort of story about, you know, can you commit to, to protection in, in when you sleep in for the rest of your life? Because we feel like that would be important for the longevity of the case. And, um, and can you commit to using your teeth a little differently? He didn't have a ton of wear and tear and certainly not, not like Bo, but he did have some recession and some things that, that identified the chewing system, likely from the bicuspid extraction, um, was put into this weird place that, that was not very balanced and doing very well. So here's how we approach this case. And this is how we typically approach all of our cases, except for some of the class threes. We do it a little differently, as I mentioned, because we don't find they require a lot of deprogramming. But we like to put them in this deprogrammer that John Coyce came up with and let them wear that for at least about 14 days and really see if we can't get this repeatable hinge axis point. And what, what, what I found many times is that in these bicuspid extraction cases, that mandible wants to come forward. Um, it is not it is not smart, and I've done this before, to just manually manipulate them and drive them back into, you know, uh, what, what we would typically think would be the CR position. But in some of these cases, <clears throat> they these teeth have been lingual retracted and the joint has never fully accepted that or never fully um, been stable with that. So we put them in the deprogrammer, find out where that mandible wants to be. And we capture that and capture that position. And then even when you have uh, misalignment like this on the bottom, we can disguise this without drilling on it. If we're able to extend the length of the teeth a little bit, we can create a new incisal edge position and we can disguise and camouflage even misalignment that that's, that's that severe. And here we are with our prototypes that we built. We again had the lab build the wax and create the, the lower position based on our records we sent them. And then we put that in place and then we hand sculpt usually the upper, in this case, it was the upper 10. I'm trying to just scoot through this, but uh, bottom line is we're able to create and back to David, to the fabrication of this work. Um, these are platinum foil restorations on the anterior and actually on the upper, we did all of them in platinum foil, as you can see here. And then the lower are pressed with the lithium disilicate. But the foil is adapted for the young people that maybe have never seen this. The platinum foil is adapted to the dye and uh, wedged, swedged on there very well. And then the porcelain is stacked on the platinum foil. And then you can remove the platinum foil from the dye and put it in the oven and fire it. So here are the prototypes. Here's some of the layering and the diagramming that uh, Juan and Nelson do to create the exact colors. And, and they use different powders. They'll use it somewhere between six to eight, sometimes 10 powder, different powders to get the effects that they're going for. Each one of those has to be fired separately. And then here's a silver dye that they put on at the very end to check contours. And then there's the final restorations, shined up and put on the dye. And then here it is inserted. One of the things we've learned about our prepless approach is that for some patients, their desire is not to have any, what they consider to be flaws or anything that we might consider to be variances in nature, like things that you see commonly that are not necessarily flaws. They're just what, what, we, what we refer to as sometimes beautiful imperfection. And so in those instances, um, it's sometimes better to divert to a more traditional preparation where you can wrap their margins all the way around to the lingual side, absolutely nothing visible or showing or no slight little deviations in long axis or anything like that. Um, we, we've gotten better at defining and determining and judging which one of our patients 
you know, which, which pathway is going to suit them the best because everybody does not always want the same thing as we all learned. So when we, when we get down to the longevity issues, we're seeing this, um, nighttime appliances are humongous <clears throat> training and coaching patients on how to use your teeth. It sounds kind of dumb, but it really is something that, that you can get pretty good at. And it makes all the difference in the world. I have David mentioned he's got had his veneers for 20 years. I've got mine for 17. Uh, it's my second set and I've done real well, but I've learned how to bite and chew and to not do certain things that I used to do to my natural teeth that tore them up to begin with. We've also learned that the night guards not only protect the teeth from breaking, but they can really minimize um, recession and some of the issues that we've seen come along with our failures. Um, you know, we can come back and polish these restorations, as I mentioned, when they're super gingival, and then we can even whiten them as we talked about to all these things we believe are going to give ourselves a little bit of a longer life for our restorations in general. And we believe that, that we can keep people happier if we can teach them these, some of these basic principles. The E appliance is our weapon for uh, night guards. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, it basically has a, a flat plane on the underneath of the upper appliance. And then it has a little stylus on the lower. And so when you put these together, the stylus is kind of able to scoot all around on the flat plane in any direction or movement that it wants to go. Um, it can really be good for, for finding some of the classic TMJ issues that people have. It locks down both ar arches like an orthodontic appliance. It's like an ortho retainer on steroids. And then it uh, really will protect your dentistry, of course, and it protects your existing natural teeth as well. Jimmy Eubank out in Dallas patented that a uh, real fine clinician, but this is the way it looks in the mouth. It takes a little bit of adjustment for some of us to wear it. I wear one every night and uh, it, it took just a few weeks to get comfortable with it and uh, recommend it highly. Uh, this is how it works though. You can see the flat plane there. And this is the way we dial every one of them in when we be sure that the stylus hits right in the center of the platform and that either excursion right or left or forward is uh, is on a straight plane there. David, I feel like I'm doing all the talking here, man. Got any questions or anything? Uh, you know, I will, I, I will talk a little bit about the appliance. I don't, I use an NTI. Um, mm -hmm. for my similar, right. There's an anterior discluding element and I use a lower slider. I tend to put the discluding element, which, what did you call it? You called it a little ramp. Little stylus. Um, I tend to put it on the maxillary arch. I just, over the years, I find that patients just like that a little better because the stylus is not hitting their lower lip. But I'm a firm believer in getting some sort of anterior midpoint appliance where they're only hitting on the front. And someone asked, and I didn't get to finish my response, um, how do these patients, airway patients do with these? And I will tell you, and not every case, but you know, I have my patients go through sleep studies when we have all this wear, right, or narrow arches. Yes. Whether they want to have double arch surgery or if they want to have a CPAP, it's up to them. I just want them to be knowledgeable, right? Yes. I've had some, some patients that have had upper airway problems. You put them on appliance like the appliance, like I do with an NTI with a, a, a manipular slider. What happens is it gives the brain the freedom to move that mandible forward without impedance. So if they're clenching and their brain is trying to open up their airway, it, it, the front teeth keep that mandible from moving forward. And that's why, and you mentioned it multiple times, we see all this wear and we didn't think about this five years ago, but certainly not 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Right. Their brain is looking away, trying to find a way to open their airway and they're moving their lower jaw and they'll break their natural teeth, they'll wear their natural teeth or they'll break their restorations. What we found just like with the e appliance with the one I, in the one that I use is now with that, the two appliances, the brain can move the mandible forward. And we've had some sleep studies where they've worn these appliance where it was really like a problem prior to the appliance. We put them in an appliance and, and I don't treat sleep. I refer all that. I just don't think I'm as good as, as someone that's, that's all they do. Right. Mm -hmm. And we've had it where the doc, where the sleep guy or gal is saying, you know what, I don't really think they need a sleep appliance. And, and actually, I like the way that are, they're functioning now. So 
someone asked that question and I don't know what you found or if you've had patients in poster or, or pre and then post E appliances with sleep studies. I, I think that is so spot on. And the um, treatment that I've been going through to try to, to, to get better airway from my own mouth has involved using some CR appliances that, uh, and, and I'm working with um, a doctor in Philadelphia that is, is really convinced that just getting the, your, uh, your centric relation position established and having some freeway space will definitely increase increase and improve your, your airway. And so I think you're spot on with all of that. And, and the e-appliance, by the way, is just one of several great ways to, to, to create the protection and the, the freedom that we're talking about. And obviously some of the mandibular advancement things that are for sleep people that are, that are definitely diagnosed with, with obstructive sleep apnea uh, will do a lot of what the e-appliance does and move the mandible forward at the same time. So there, there's a multitude of ways to attack this. Uh, I think what the, the point we all agree on is that we need to, to explain to our patients in the very front end that if you come in and you beat your teeth up and then we're going to just put you some nice looking veneers on there and then we're going to all live happily ever after is not real life. That's, that's not reality. Uh, some, some habits and some things have to change or else they will tear up whatever we put in there, including even, even lithium disilicate. Ultimately they'll move some teeth around or something will happen. The muscles always win as, as we say in dentistry. So um, I think we all would agree with that. Absolutely. That's what we say. Muscles always win. And the problem is people are using stronger materials thinking that's going to overcome the problem where, that's yeah, right. monolithic zirconia may not break, but something, it, it, there's going to be a develop somewhere because the muscles, yeah. always win. you'll see, phrenitis, you'll see phrenitis, you'll see um, recession, you'll see recession, you'll see teeth break on opposing arches. You yes. see, I mean, it's yeah. The weak links will come out. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, it's really fascinating how that all these weapons are out there and you just got to assemble a pathway that, that you feel comfortable with that, that you feel like the, the evidence is there that this will be successful. And, this collaboration, as we're trying to do tonight, I think is just invaluable for everybody to, to start trying to figure out some things that, you know, somebody's figured out, hey, this works pretty good. You know, in my hands, this will, this will be pretty successful. And you can start to really, with, with passion, convincing your patients to, to follow you, you know, and, and to let you treat them. So I think it's all good stuff. It is good well, stuff. And you're hitting all the, the points, you know, I think, you know, everything you've talked about is you know, hopefully you have, you have told the audience, and we have a good audience and I, is that you're not a cosmetic dentist, Dennis, you know, you are a functional aesthetic dentist. You're looking, you're just not giving a beautiful smile. If they want that, send a whitening tray home with them. And, and that's the extent of it that you're paying attention to all these factors are going to improve their health and in, increase in long-term prognosis as well. And I think that's missed, missed on a lot of dentists that are doing dentistry. They're cosmetic dentists. I, I think that's well said. And <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't have more time to, you know, when I'm just kind of flying through these photos and showing you a, a new programmer and then showing you a finished case. I know there's a lot of missing gaps in there in the middle that uh, believe me are kind of the grunt work of doing this stuff. But um, it's, it's certainly a process that, that all of us have to figure out some methodology that we can predictably get to those, those finish lines like that. And then, and then hopefully, see the longevity follow that so that's the goal well this is a, a subject matter that um, i have really been focused on in recent years and and again kind of forced upon me as we would do so many cases if, if you've noticed the 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 big popularity now obviously on instagram and other social media sites of, of showing before and after cases and doctors are really learning they can market themselves almost purely right out of, out of that one area and become famous cosmetic dentists, you know, then one of the things you, they also figure out is that there are certain ways in, that you want to show images and there's certain things you don't want to show. And one guy in particular, uh, and I'm a big fan of his, he does some beautiful, beautiful dentistry. He has one of the best ceramics on the planet, but he shows the exact uh, 
the same comp composition of the photos each time, which is really smart. Puts Vaseline on the teeth, which is really on the lips, rather, which is really smart. And then he never shows anybody that doesn't have a pretty mouth to begin with, like, you know, what, what we would call a pretty mouth. Uh, and, and so what I want to point out here that we've had to learn, and particularly as we've done a lot of prepless dentistry, is that there's a big difference between a pretty smile and a pretty mouth. Um, and, 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 you know, what we'd say beautiful mouth versus beautiful teeth. Because look at this very famous lady that I know needs no introduction here. Everybody knows who this is. And look how beautiful and gorgeous, you know, her features are and everything. But then look at her teeth. And, and I don't think anybody on this, uh, on this chat tonight would, would say, now that's Nirvana as far as the teeth shapes and things like that. You know, in fact, they're a little weak. But it really almost doesn't matter, does it? Because, you know, she's got such a beautiful lips, dynamics, and, and so forth, that it just works. And then look at this guy, you know, he's, he's obviously uh, one of the most handsome guys on the planet, according to People Magazine and everybody else. And yet, you know, there's something very compelling about his lips and his face, but look at his teeth. They're pretty beat up, and there's a lot of things that are compromised about that. And then there's more dramatic examples of this that will come into to my office and your office from time to time. But this is a, a young lady that uh, sought help for us that she just hated her smile, that she had spaces between her teeth, which you can't see in the straight on view, but you will from the side. And, and all that her and her family were focused on was her teeth. And obviously, there is, this is a no win thing for any, any, anything you want to do to the teeth. In my opinion, you're going to still lose this battle because of the lips shapes and dynamics and, and just the way the mouth is, is formed. Um, so when, when people come into our practice, as much as we want to really focus on <clears throat> looking at how we can make the teeth better, we are forced to look at soft tissue more and more. And this is a case that we actually agreed, uh, ironically, after much pushback and after saying all the things that we can accomplish here, they still felt like when we did the mock-up that they wanted to enhance the teeth as much as we could with the veneering, which we did with just some gingivectomy and some prepless veneers. And we were able to augment and do a lot of things to, to improve arguably a little bit of the teeth, but it pretty much has no impact, in our opinion, because of the lip dynamics. So this is one of the more extreme cases, but I think it just points out that, that as we're doctors of teeth, we have to really, as David was just talking about, we have to be much broader in our vision of what, what we're there to accomplish and, and how we're able to see the entire field that we're playing in and not, not just one segment of it. Here's another example um, to document my point here. This young lady won Miss Tennessee a few years back with that smile. Pretty crazy, isn't it? Um, but from a distance and in the right lighting, I guess it worked well enough. And she was obviously had a beautiful, beautiful lips, beautiful, you know, everything was pulling her forward, even if the teeth were really strongly working against her. So this is a case to the contrary, you almost can do anything and you're going to, you're going to be okay because we've got the big frame, the big lips. Um, we, we've got a little bit of small presence of the teeth and we've got some old bonding on there that, that I'm grateful for whoever did this, that, that, you know, they didn't, they preserved her natural teeth in enamel, but they didn't do the greatest job. I think we'd all agree, but um Tissue was inflamed. Everything was working against her. But again, still a lovely lady. So this is, this is a sissy case, I would argue to you, in so many ways, to just take off the bonding, clean up the tissue health. Notice on number six, I'll point out a flaw here. We wanted to do some crown lengthening. We, were, we knew we'd have to do some osseous changes. And she was getting ready to go from the Miss Tennessee to the Miss USA pageant. And there was not enough time from the time we got a hold of her for the healing to occur. And so we just agreed to leave that compromise and to just do the electrosurge or the laser to the most we could possibly exploit out of that. 
So back to selection of cases, we have learned that when you have somebody with a big frame, you've got a lot of grace and a lot of room to consider doing some additive only restorations. And then I think this is my last little topic here that I wanted to talk about that is, is a really, at least a few years ago when I, we were out hitting it pretty hard in the lecture trail, the, th this got to be heated discussions <laughs> about, okay, I, you know, I, I don't want to do your no prep stuff because of various reasons, but I do really like being conservative. So I want to do minimally prep. So there became this debate of, of several of us. It got, it got a little humorous at times because we were all kind of, you know, tongue in cheek about it. It was a very friendly debate, but we we're looking at the pros and cons of doing no preparation versus doing some minimal prep like you're seeing on the right here. In this case, by the way, uh, on the right screen is one that I photographed from a manual, from, from a magazine. So in all fairness, the photography is not, not as strong and it's, it's a copy. But this happens to be one of, I think, the most gifted guys on the planet, Dennis Lee Pascal, Marjane, uh, one of my friends and somebody that I have such deep respect for. But he simply differs in the notion, in the, in the strategy of doing no prep versus minimal prep. And um, so I'm definitely, you know, very humbly presenting my case because that guy's a, a, a just a, he crushes. But here's what I would tell you, that, that this is the case that before he prepped it, this is the before on the left. And I look at that and I see nothing that I would want to remove. It feels like it's the perfect case to me to, to execute it doing these things that we've been working on for the last 20 years and leaving all the enamel in place. <clears throat> but there are some pros and cons. And I think we would all agree, this is again, a, a photocopy of it, so it's not very good picture, but we would all agree that's an amazing end result. And his brother, Michelle, does some amazing ceramics and they did the front four in this case. And I think it's gorgeous. So you're definitely going to get to the same place, uh, I would argue, and, and, you know, and not, not have something that you're not going to like either way. It's just here's some things to consider. When you're looking at prepping around the cervical marginal area there, the average thickness of enamel by Ferrari's study back in 92 is three to five tenths of a millimeter. And Pascal argues that when you're cutting this marginal chamfer, you're somewhere in the three to four tenths range of your preparation. The one he just showed, he would argue is still somewhere shallow chamfers, he says, in that three to point, point three to point four millimeter range. And it still allows, he says, for a good chameleon effect of the margins and, and staying super gentle and so forth. But, so, so here's the problem, as I see it, is that you got to be one really skilled guy to produce to, to, to do your cervical margins and stay in that three to four point three to point four millimeter range. And you're getting dangerously close to exposing some of the cervical dent in there. Uh, so that's one concern that I would argue is, you know, avoidable if you, if you don't have to prep on the teeth. And then um, there are some advantages when you do prep on it, you're going to definitely get ability to control your contours just a little bit better and a little more ideally, no, no doubt about that. Um, you're going to be able to um, make the case a little easier. Ceramics can manage the, the case a little bit better if they're a little thicker. No, no, not as much accidental breakage and so forth. <clears throat> and then you can get a little more uniform in your color when the thickness of the ceramic is more uniform, you know, and a little thicker. There's a, those are definitely advantages to doing the three to five tenths millimeter prep. And then you can definitely temporize it more with your bis acrylic or whatever you like to use, as opposed to doing more of the hands kind of stuff that we like to do. But then you're going to darken the tooth a little bit at the cervical area whenever you prep into it just a little bit. We all know that when you're taking off a little bit of the enamel filter, you're getting closer to the dent. And so it's going to naturally get just a little bit darker, which may in some cases be okay. And in some cases it may be a little hard to bounce it back. Um, you're getting dangerously close to going through the enamel into the dentin unless you're really, really good. And then here's to me is the biggest thing of all, kind of the trump card, is that you can't just reverse it. You can't cut these off or, or use a laser and take them off one day 
and be back to your original tooth. Not that many people are going to do that, but I think that's an option of banking tooth structure that's, that's got some value. And then sometimes, you know, you're getting parents involved and things like that. They're just simply not going to agree to any kind of preparation like that. And while we kind of think of this as just not that painful, not that involved, no big deal, you know, us dentists, we don't worry about a little preparation like that. But many times the patients really have a whole different view emotionally about it. You know, they view it as damaged and, and even some of them that use the word nubs, you know, you cut my teeth to nubs. So, so for, for me, as I compare this minimal prep to the infinity margin, like we believe might be more superior in many cases, not all, but I believe sometimes it can be more superior. And again, this is not fair. The case on the left here is a, a photograph, but we're showing you a result doing it with no preparation on the right that we feel like will rival for sure and still leave all the two structure in place, still not take a risk that we're going to puncture into the dentin somewhere <clears throat> and end up with margins that arguably could even be a little less visible in the long run. So we're big on this whole con concept of trying to do no preparation as opposed to some minimal preparation, even though both are very conservative approaches and both will definitely get you to the finish line. There's just some things that we think might be better in some cases. And then lastly, I'll show you the finishing of the infinity margins and we'll stop for questions. David, do we need to stop and, and, and have a question and answer yeah, now? Or finish this up. Keep going? Why don't you finish this up and then you got like five more minutes probably on this? Yeah. Yeah. I can be, I can be quick here. Perfect. So, so, some of where the rubber meets the road is how you manage these infinity margins and how you smooth them up. And we have found that, that we use this, this approach and it works pretty good for us. But basically, we, we go in with little mosquito diamonds and trim the little bit of extra porcelain, the, the resin cement, and, and feather it down with the, with the diamonds to where we don't feel it anymore with the Explorer. Then we can come back with our uh, diamond impregnated silicone wheels like you're seeing here in figure seven and we can smooth around that and then we come back a, a little trick we've learned is to then come back with a um, a liquid dam kind of material like you're like we're showing right here this is actually uh, some stuff that we use for bleach block out on when you used to do bleach models they would send you this block out material that works really good we had a ton of that but you roll that around and cover up the gingiva so that you don't beat it up and then you're able to get your Robertson bristle brush and get right down and put the same kind of luster and finish on the margins as the ceramics do in the lab. You have your ceramics really blow a lot of air, full speed air right around the tooth so that you don't heat it up because heat is obviously our enemy here. We don't want to get too hot. But we found if you'll take a minute or two and put this guard over your tissue so you can get right down in that zone, you can really smooth and polish uh, and get right back to the original kind of finish. And, and then take you off your guard. That's what it looks like immediately after you got them all polished up. And then a week or two later on the right there is the final, or this is the final product here. So uh, that, that infinity margin in our opinion is money. And we, we still believe after almost 20 years that that's a valid way to do porcelain veneers. And one that should be a tool that, that people keep in their toolbox. And David, I could go on, but I'll stop right there, man, and um, Dude, take man, on any questions. We have to, because I know people would like to to um, have this information from you. Your stuff is beautiful. You know, I, I, do you remember yeah. when, I, when I stayed at your house? Well, it must have been 20 years ago, because Phoenix, my son Phoenix, was well, six. He's 27 now. And your brother came into your office. Remember, I said, I want to see these prep lists. <laughs> you remember me sitting down with an explorer and, and looking at his stuff? I do. And they're absolutely beautiful. You do beautiful work. A couple of things I, I would like to, to mention that I would like for you to address is, you know, I've had doctors because I've done some courses on minimal prep and prepless veneers is doctors say, well, if, if you just go in there and take an impression, do you charge less? And it's like, no, I, I don't charge less because it's actually more work in my opinion, um, especially cementation, which we're not going to be able to talk about. You, you know, you, I'm sure, and I will say I absolutely have. I broke veneers when I went to try to mend when they're 0.2 millimeters and they're felt spathic. And it's like, you gotta be freaking yes. kidding me. So even trying them on the model as you're looking at the whole look, planning the, the smile design is huge on these cases too, because if you don't, if you don't plan it right, I think too many dentists, 
you know, they just say, oh, yeah, we'll do prep posts. They take an impression, they take photos and they get it back and everything's bulky. And we, we've seen that with, you know, a lot of the, the lumineers that, that we saw, you know, in, in 20, 10 to 20 years ago. So it, it, talk a little bit about your fees and not, not exactly your fees, but, you know, are they the same whether it's a prep or a non-prep? Also, I think a, a lot of doctors may not know that usually the lab bill is higher for um, a fel, certainly a felspathic or a powdered powder liquid and a minimal prep manure because they're really difficult to, to make. I, in fact, you mentioned Mark Willis and one time he used to be at Utah Valley Dental Lab and you were doing some stuff with him and, and I came up to his bench and I said, let me see some of these things that Dennis is doing, right? And so he had a case, your case there and I said, wow, that's awesome. And I picked one up and I said, are these hard to make? Do you ever break them? <laughs> and he pulled out his drawer and he brought out a box like a probably a quarter of the size of a shoe box. And it was full of broken veneers. And he said, yeah, I break them all day long. And so it's going to cost you more. And I say that to doctors, you know, if you find a talented ceramics, it's still doing powder liquid. Yes. It's minimal prep. But you, you want to add to that a little bit? Well, I certainly want to agree with everything you said there. And, and our fee is the same, whether we do prepless or conventional, I'm getting ready to change that and actually increase the prepless fee over the conventional things, because I do think it, it just requires more um, effort on our part when it's all said and done. Um, it, it's, you definitely don't, you definitely don't want to be in the business of making an impression and send it to the lab and say, make me eight or 10 veneers. Um, that, that is going to have a low batting average, in my opinion, of success. You, the, the way we build custom prototypes and all that and the test driving, all those factors give patients lots of confidence that, you know, we're on the right track. And, and as, as you know, David, we, we live in, like you, we live in a, in a very energetic town, a lot of entertainers and people and we, we treated a lot of people that are pretty visible. And many times there's no way in the world they would ever agree to do a traditional preparation on their teeth and, you know, traditional veneers that once they understand that we've always got a back door that we will test drive the prototypes. Even when we bond on the permanents, if you hate it, we can cut them off. You know, we've had to do that before. We've had to do that once. <laughs> so it's, if it's been done, it's probably possible, right? And you can do that. And so um, these things give a lot of peace and comfort to people and they're willing to pay for that oftentimes uh, for, for the ability to be safer like that. So, Definitely, I agree that it's a it's a more complex game as as a whole. Not to say that the doing really high end lithium disilicate stuff is, is equally challenging as well. I, I think you could argue that as well. It's hard to make a, a monolithic block really look like a real tooth, but it's possible. It's been done. So all these your, things are just difficult pursuits. What composite? I want to ask what composite are you using for your prototypes? Right now, we're using uh, Ivaclar's. Um, it used to be the, um, uh, oh man, I just totally drew a blank there. What's, what's the new, so they have tetric, composite, tetric, the tetric, uh, what's it called though? It's, um, it's a new tetric, but anyway, the tetric ceram was what we used for a long, long time and, and still like that a lot. I use some, um, helium molar as well, uh, from time to time. I, I like things that are not very runny, that are very stiff where I can sculpt and, and keep, keep in control of them. Um, and, and the prototype is part of your fee. You build it just like I would with my provisions. Correct. That's yes. correct. And, you know, that, something that's right. ask about uh, the, the thing that I would do different now than what you did with that case that you opened it up and you had the wax up with the Lux attempts is someone, mm -hmm. I would do PMMAs. I would have the lab wax or design visually because PMMAs, you know, they're actually, the anatomy is amazing and, and, they're actually, I think, more affordable because they don't break and they don't wear. So I would do, because someone asked about, I would do PMMAs. I would have, you know, you use Rego on that case. To have a scan. That's a good way to do it. Then you can just... Do you, do you have any...